when Fazilla sent me the, the um, information about this meeting, she actually asked two or three questions which are a little different from the ones that she, that she asked today that I think might be a different way for us to approach the same topic. Um, and the answer to the first one is very short, and the answer to the two others is, is, far, more, is far longer and more interesting. The first question she asked is, is the economy on the right growth path? And I think the answer has to be no. The two other questions are, what are the prospects for making it more inclusive? I don't think personally that the prospects are very good. And I think it depends to a very large degree on people like you in civil society. And that we, the media, have at best a reinforcing um, effect and a facilitative effect to what you do. And then she asked, how does the media, how should the media report on the economy? And that's obviously the question that, that I think that interests you the most here. Um, I think we have two main responsibilities, and I'm going to try not to repeat. I mean, I agree with much of what my colleagues have said, but I'll try not to repeat it. So I think we have two main responsibilities, and one is to report as efficiently on those excluded as we report on those included. And I don't think we report that efficiently actually on those included either, for all sorts of reasons. Um, one of the conversations we have in our newsroom is this. Why is Julius Malema's breaking watch so interesting? And the watch which is worn by the chief executive of First Rand, not interesting at all. And the reason comes up in our discussions, well, the thing about Julius Malema is how he got his watch. And if he got his watch in an underhand manner, then the watch becomes interesting. Okay. Whereas in the society in which we live, it's perfectly all right for the chief executive of First Rand to do what he does and to get a very large watch out of it. But what about the chief executive of Premier Milling? or some of the other milling and bread companies, which have done illegal things in, in our country, putting up and the bread price and colluding over the bread price. Why are we not photographing him with his hand like this and focusing on the watch? And I think that's a very important question, actually, that we in the media need to answer and that we don't answer very well. So whereas I agree with, um, with Mondley that we do report well on the whole on companies, um, there's quite a lot that we don't report on on company reporting that we should. I'd like to make an exception of Anne Crotty, you know, who's in, in our stable and of whom we are very proud and who's done some really pioneering work on, for instance, on chief executive pay. But on the whole, I don't think we go nearly deep enough into the corporate world. As seriously, if not more seriously, we don't report well on those who are excluded. And there, I need to just very briefly pay, um, uh, acknowledge what my colleagues have said. It is very much a question of resources to, I think, a large degree. Um, somebody mentioned the lack of proximity. Uh, gives you in the, the lack of proximity in our reporting. And there's a very simple reason for that. Um, more and more telephone journalism, what you call uh, desktop journalism. And when you, when you do telephone journalism, the people that you can reach are people in government. They won't always talk, but you can reach them. You can reach people in the corporate world. Some people reach you even before you reach them. Helen Ziller and her people in the Western Cape are very, very good at that. The people that you can't reach are the people whose names you don't even know until you've driven to their street and found out that they live next to the huge garbage pile that you're trying to get the authorities to explain. You don't even know the name of the woman who lives on the corner of that street next to the garbage until you've driven there. And even if you didn't know her name, she might or might not have a telephone. So it's far more difficult, actually, to report on those excluded, and it's not a job that we do very well. But then I think we have another responsibility, and I think that's what um, Fazilla would really w w wanted me to talk about today, which is the responsibility to encourage debate. And at the Cape Times, we've tried to do that in quite a systematic way. Um, at the end of last year, we launched a series which we called The Next Economy, and that was based on two premises. The first one was that the crisis, as the world calls it, is not new to us here. That right through the years when we had no crisis, in fact, when we had the longest period of consecutive economic growth South Africa had ever known, as we were repeatedly told, actually most people in the country lived in a crisis anyway. So the crisis is not new. Firstly. Secondly, the crisis is an opportunity as well to build something better. And what can we do in our very small way at the Cape Times about that? Well, what we can do is to encourage debate. So we launched this series, which started late last year. It was noticed by the very new Minister of Economic Development. And he approached us to broaden the series a little bit and to actually have events where people would speak. So we, we started a partnership with the Economic Development Ministry and the South African New Economics Network that you all know, um, which has been putting the material on its website. And we tried to invite, kick it off by inviting quite a range of people and then allow people to, to offer their own, um, their own material. 
we've tried to um, get a range of people from Terry Bell to Francis Wilson, Selim Badat, Temba Nolutungu, Iraj Abedian, mainstream, non-mainstream, and so on. And it's been going now for about a, a little bit more than a year. But we've now reached a point where a, we, meet a, we meet a couple of challenges in this debate that we should have foreseen. The first is to go beyond the general. Because a lot of people like to talk about the general, and as my colleagues have said, we're all pro-poor, nobody <coughs> thinks poverty is a good thing, everybody thinks unemployment is a terribly bad thing. And it's very difficult to go beyond the consensus in, in, a, in, a, in a sharp way that will actually take the debate forward. That's the first challenge. The second challenge is to take the debate outside the newspaper, because there's immediately been a demand for that. We've held two sessions already in, in, in Parliament, and at both sessions, um, people came up to us to say, okay, that's fine, but now please will you come to the library in Cryfontein, or will you come to the Kailicha Business Forum, or will you come to the UCT SRC? With the same high-powered people, Danny Yordan, this or that minister, Zuelin Zima Vavi, um, Bobby Gotzel, with the same high-powered people to talk to us about the economy. And that's a very important challenge, I think, um, which the Cape Times is far too small to meet. But in, in our small way, we will, try to, we will try to do that, to take that debate um, you know, out into the, um, out, out, outside the columns of our newspaper and outside Parliament. So uh, I, I think that, um, that far more important, actually, than what I think about the economy, and I'm actually not part of Mondi's consensus, just for the record, but far more important than what I think about the, the economy is actually what I use the columns of the newspaper that I've got the privilege of guiding for the moment to debate. So what you think about the economy and what people like you and others think about the economy um, is what matters. And I just wanted to quote, if I could, from to end, um, to quote from a, a, a talk Emmanuel Wallerstein gave late last year. I don't know if anybody here went to it, but it was very striking. He, he gave this talk on the collapse of the financial system in the old mutual auditorium in Pineland. And in the mutual <laughs> auditorium in Finland, he ended by saying, it was a very long and erudite to talk about Kondratiev cycles and so on, but at the end of it, he, he said a few things that I think are very important for, for us in, in newspapers. He said, what are the practical steps that any of us can do now in the transition from the present to whatever the future will be in the world economy? And he, he came up with three or four things. He said, the first thing we can do is to minimize the pain. The pain that arises from the breakdown of the existing system, the pain that arises from the confusions of the transition. And he said, he, I personally, he said, I wouldn't sneer at winning an election, at obtaining some more benefits within the states for those who have least materially. I wouldn't sneer at the protection of judicial and political rights. I wouldn't sneer at combating some further erosion of our planetary wealth and conditions for collective survival. I wouldn't sneer at any of those. So that was one kind of guiding principle that I think is important. But most importantly, he said, what we can do is engage in endless, serious, intellectual debate about the parameters of the kind of world system we want and the strategy of transition. And he said, and through it all, we must put at the forefront of our consciousness and our action the struggle against the three fundamental inequalities of the world, gender, class, and race, race ethnicity, religion. This is one category for him. This is the hardest task of all since there are none of us who are guiltless and none of us who are pure. And the entire world culture that we have all inherited militates against that. And then finally, he said, this is the end, um, we must run like the plague from any sense that history is on our side, that the good society is certain to come. History is on no one's side. We have at best a 50-50 chance of creating a better world system than the one in which we now live, but 50-50 is a lot. We must try to seize fortune, even if it escapes us. What more useful thing can any of us do? Quite a lot of work goes in most newspapers um, into cleaning up the ideology. And I mean, one of our rules, which is of course not always well followed, is to get the other side of the story. I mean, that's the cardinal fundamental rule of journalism. And when we don't do it, you should be very critical of us, as we should be of, of ourselves. I think the danger is really that people don't always realize that ideology is creeping in. And I, I mean, I can just speak for, for our newspaper. I find that quite often. Um, I've got four examples that, uh, it's soon after Polo Kwane, quite a senior political writer wrote that the new national executive of the ANC was infested with Zuma supporters. And he wrote it as a fact. This is a fact. It is infested with Zuma supporters. If we remove the word. It's very seldom that um, Malema is referred to except as a firebrand. Um, the youth are almost always referred to as disgruntled. And my personal favorite, and I, I know a lot of people don't see why this is an ideological position, is taxpayers' money. It is not taxpayers' money that is being wasted on somebody's residence or car or whatever. It is everybody's money. But 
there, there's, there's an ideology behind that which is not visible. And that's, that's the really dangerous part, I think, because the rest we can weed out by following the rules and getting more than one side to the story and f putting the sources on the record and so on. But it's these insidious little things which are actually the orthodoxy creeping in in ways that we don't see it creeping in. Um, that, that we need to guard against. And we need you know, help from readers in, in doing that because it, it is very insidious.